it wasn't that things weren't going to pan. It was simply that the plan kept evolving as the situation became more... complicated, Dilgrim said to himself as he crept through the waist-high grass. Well, waist-high grass for humans anyway, as a dwarf he only had to hunch over a bit, and the halflings didn't have to hunch over at all as long as they were wearing hats, which they weren't. The elven rangers were slowly leading them east toward the centaur lands between the druids and the fae of this fractured valley. Just two days ago, he thought they were home free. For half a week, their group caravaned across the blighted grey waste of the Deadlands, persistently aware that any misstep would make them pray for that land's cursed and evil, unendingly hungry denizens. After successfully dodging, sneaking, and occasionally fighting the flesh-eaters and blood-drinkers, they had reached the hidden valley of their long-lost kin, and expected, rather naively, that they would be welcomed with open arms. But it hadn't turned out that way, and the thought of it turned sour in his mind. He looked over at his brother, stealthily padding next to him, and saw the silver frass pouch hung on his belt. "'I envy you your flask at moments like this,' he whispered to Durkin. "'You the discipline of iron not to swig at it every minute.' Durkin smirked at that. "'What makes you think I don't?' he replied in hushed tones. But Dilgrim was right. He didn't. Whiskey-thicket liquor had no peer in the world and was sought as keenly as gold amongst kings, nobles, and connoisseurs everywhere. And, of course, the excuse to distribute it far and wide had made Whiskey Thicket quite wealthy. That and the side hustle their little band had been doing undiscovered for decades. But the accomplished rogue knew alcohol at this moment would be most unwise. It wouldn't serve a dwarf to mix business with that kind of pleasure, regardless of the calibre of the spence. It wasn't the dwarf's discipline so much as the fear of a goblin with a jagged blade finding him in an intoxicated moment. Getting an enemy inebriated and quietly bleeding them during their drunken reverie was a much better use of the booze at his belt. Dilgrim smiled back for a moment. The thing caught the familiar and unwelcome whiff of something in the air. Smoke and fire the weapons against the farmers and producers of the valley. Even in the fading light of the late afternoon, it was apparent the goblin raiders were out, taking their brute fight to the less defended folk. Multiple smoke columns curled upwards into the blue sky behind, beside, and in front of them. The leader of the rangers noiselessly slipped through the grass toward them and knelt close. Not far off, Dilgru could hear the growls and shouts of a war party coming, their climbing weapons putting them perhaps only a few hundred yards off, he judged. They've boxed us in. We can't slip past without cutting through them in the way to the Midwood Forest, he said. The snore from ahead, a throaty gutter oak sow deeper and louder, came from the same direction. A terrible noise that all recognized. And they have trolls, the elf finished. Ilgrim can finish with them, Durkin said with a wry smile. He's got skills. The elf looked unimpressed. You haven't shown much prowess so far other than being reasonably quiet for a dwarf. Although the ranger's face betrayed no hostility, the last words came out with a spear. We'll need more than parlor tricks to get through that line. He had barely finished speaking when the swish of arrows from the ranger's bows vibrated in the air, followed by the screams of perforated goblins. The twin hobbits, Domin and Fengden, were at once next to him, the bows of St. Genevieve in hand. It's true, they have trolls and ogres. The bastards will be upon us in half a minute. So, we're committed. Dilgren thought with a curse in his sigh. His preference was always for stealth and persuasion as opposed to his brother, who routinely employed more direct preference. But it seems the guards arranged things to his brother's preferences. 
Very well, then. The elf leader was already standing and sending arrows shaft after shaft as quickly as he could draw his bow. Whatever parlor tricks you have to spend, he said, letting another missile fly, do them now. The hobbit stood at the ready and Durkin nodded to Dilgrim quickly with an expression of haste. Go! Dilgrim stood to his full height and looked over the grass. Perhaps a hundred fifty paces away, a mob of horrible creatures rushed toward them, some on foot, some bound to wolves on crude leathern saddles. The goblins and orcs were sprinting in, but it was the green-skinned, foul creatures towering behind them that made the blood run cold. They would eat a man alive, not waiting for the end of combat, and make its compatriots watch even as they desperately tried to kill it. Oh, and the cursed beasts regenerated and healed at an astonishing rate, the wounds closing up even as you slashed more of them. Only a few things would leave a permanent mark, and Gilgrim knew what they were. He pulled out his wand. The gold and silver shaft was marked by tiny red crystals bound in filigree curls and arcane symbols. Inside each perfect cavachon stone danced a shimmering red and orange spark, at once rising and falling like a tiny candle flickery in a breeze, the faint smell of burning tallow forever wrapped around it. The delicacy of the wand's appearance belied its immense power, but a magic-sensitive individual could feel the vibrations of the magical weave touching it, just as the tremble of heavy hooves on nearby ground could be discerned by a ranger. He held it at arm's length and scanned for the perfect target. There. There between the ogres and trolls where their numbers are densest, he thought. He did not wait. His mind flowed through the words and mental symbols to strung the unspoken trigger. A swirl of hot, honey-yellow light circled his wrist. He rode quickly down the shaft to the wand's tip. There a pause for an instant, growing angry, hellish red, the force streaking the distance between the small band and the oncoming horde. It flew faster than an arrow through them, shearing the air like tearing fabric with a wake of pitch and sulfur. Once among the towering hulks, the glowing crimson bead no larger than a grape detonated. The flash was blinding for a split second, and the report and roar rolled over them, incinerating everything in a ball of flame forty feet across. All howls of the creatures were drowned out by the din of the conflagration consuming them. Dilgrim did not waste a moment to assess the damage. He changed his stance, chose the next closest threat, and unleashed another fireball, and then another, until only a small, hardened group that had escaped the firestorm continued to approach. But the survivors could be managed. The battalion of monsters had been reduced to a few squads. By now, the other group members had begun their attacks. The twins unreached wave after wave of vicious energy bolts from their bows, each creature struck by the searing light blown apart into burnt, mangled pieces. Ogres, orcs, and goblins alike were knocked off their feet, bowled over by the mad charge of our shape-shifting hobbits' boar form. And then there was the unmistakable hum of Durkin's vorpal blade working its vivisecting surgical skill on the dwindling numbers of terrified goblins. Dilgrim had never seen an elf surprised, impressed, or frightened, and he wasn't sure that he was seeing it now. But, and as he glanced at the ranger leader, he was confident the elf wasn't expecting quite a show of magical and martial power from this humble group. The stories were true then, not idle boasts, Master Dwarf. You all seem to conceal singular skills, most extraordinary. It was the closest thing to a compliment he had ever heard from an elf. Too bad he didn't have long to appreciate it. A fellow ranger sprinted up and spoke curtly. We see more coming, at least three companies of mixed troops. Dilgrim caught a glimpse of a goblin menacing not thirty steps away, needing attention. He mumbled under his breath and a bright shaft of yellow-white light burst from his fingertip and struck the beast square on the chest with a crackle. 
and bang, sending the assailant to the goblin afterlife. So, at best we have perhaps four minutes before they reach us. Gilgrim heard what had to be an elven curse under the leader's breath. We need to make a run for the forest, he called to the group. I hope you and your comrades run as well as you fight Master Dwarf. Durkin shoulder-bumped his brother as they broke into a sprint. You always were such a bloody show-off.